130 years ago, uh, Emma Lazarus uh, wrote the New Colossus, which was a tribute to the Statue of Liberty. I'd like to read the last part of that particular poem, which I think so much describes a lot of what we're talking about here today. Uh, and it is, um, she cries with silent lips, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. I think to some degree we forget that the homeless are actually part of what all of our history and all of our background as, as members of this community are because many of our immigrant parents and grandparents came to this country yearning to be free and to find that better future. The homeless of our community today actually have many services available to them that other communities do not provide. So programs like the Interfaith Emergency Shelter System, uh, the Egan Warming Centers, and the Conestoga Huts that are coming forward, Opportunity Village, uh, and the many efforts that the faith communities and the broader community have put into place over the last 20 years, I think are quite unique. The car camping program that has been sponsored by the City of Eugene over the last decade is one of those unique tools where we have currently around 100 citizens out there living in vehicles, in parking lots, uh, and, and in private property and on a faith communities parking lots uh, that allows them the opportunity to have some safety and dignity as they transition uh, back from homelessness back into the community. And one of the misconceptions that often occurs is, is that do the homeless actually move forward? Uh, I checked with my staff that worked on that program uh, and as much as 50% of the people that we see through those various homeless programs actually end up going back into permanent stable housing and reintegrating back into the community. So in comparison to many areas around the United States, Eugene Springfield, Lane County is actually performing pretty well. But here's the danger. Unfortunately, we're in times, as Larry was pointing out earlier, where financial tools are not a lot available from the public sector. And if you think about most healthy communities and a description of those healthy communities, you'd really be describing a three-legged stool. That would be public funds, the nonprofit sector, and the, and the private sector. And you expect those three legs to try and support the various programs of our communities. Well, the public fund portion of that discussion is rapidly diminishing. And unfortunately, those sources associated with nonprofits are not elastic. Nonprofit organizations in this community, to my, in my feeling, have really stretched their resources about as far as they possibly can. Uh, whether that's uh, shelter care, whether it's food for Lane County, uh, whether it's uh, uh, Central Latino, uh, or other groups, especially groups like Women's Space, which really have very inelastic budgets. The stretch that they do really is done at the expense of their staff, working them way too hard, and at the same time, trying to find a way to take their major reserves to try and stretch one little bit further to try and cover their budget. Same way with the faith communities. Currently, faith communities in our community cover a vast panoply of services, everything from emergency housing through the Interfaith Emergency Shelter Systems or the Egan Warming Centers or the car camping programs to food and clothing vouchers that you get through many of the faith communities out there, providing both volunteers and places in their faith communities uh, to try and make sure that the homeless are well taken care of. It's difficult for us as a nonprofit provider to go out to those groups and ask them for more support when they have been so generous for so long. I remember talking uh, to uh, many of the, of the faith community leaders uh, 20 years ago when we started the, emergency, the Interfaith Emergency Shelter System and the question was, well, how long will the faith communities have to do, do the night shelter? And I said, oh, it can't be forever. After all, I'm sure we'll solve the problems of the homeless in the 90s. <laughs> Dan, I hope you're still here and you'll forgive me. 20 years later, we have not managed to fulfill that bold comment of we're going to find a way to get through it. Although, as the chair of Opportunity Village, I think that you are working on a unique and innovative way to try and do that. So the message I bring to you is, is that this is the best of times and it is the worst of times. I really like m mangling historical documents or, and novels, um, as Dickens so well put it in The Tale of Two Cities. It's the best of times in that we as a community respond well to the issues associated with those that are in need in our community. 
those homeless, tempest-tossed individuals that we see on our streets and around our community. And I'm very proud of that, and I'm proud to be in alliance with the groups up here and, of course, the many people out in our community. But I will tell you that the issue is not becoming less, and it is much more difficult today because as we lose those public funds, expecting the private sector or the nonprofit sector or the faith communities to step forward to, fur to firm up that third leg of the stool, I do not think is a realistic solution. This is something we will have to go back to our public leaders and say, actually, our community functions well on two of those legs. We need to get that third leg firmed up. Thank you.